This is a working home server bill complete with ECC memory. And today I'm gonna to show you how this is built. I know a lot of you don't have a ton of time for YouTube videos. Well, hopefully for mine, but if that's the case, I have put all the parts listed down below in the description and you can go ahead and build this as it was tested and try it out on your own. If you wanna learn more and see some of the pitfalls that could happen, continue watching. And if you're just gonna stop watching and buy those parts, well, can you kind of click the like button? Welcome to part two on my DIY home NAS server build. In part one, I explained why I felt this ASRock B550M PG Riptide motherboard is the best MATX board for building a home NAS server that's on the market currently. Today, we're gonna take this to the next step and we're gonna get this to actually boot and see if it lives up to my expectations. So that means for today, we're gonna be talking power supplies, processors, and memory. Now, when starting any new build, the first thing I like to do is get the board powered up. The way to do that is to simply connect your power supply. This MATX motherboard can operate off an ATX power supply, but because of the confines in trying to build in a smaller server case, I am limited to an SFX power supply. The difference between ATX and SFX, besides the size, is, is gonna be the cost. The smaller SFX does cost a little bit more. When it comes to selecting a power supply, you should always select a quality one, but this is a good opportunity, depending on your needs, to either save a little money or spend a little more money. And I think in my case, it meant spend a little bit more money. And that is because I went with a very high quality SFX power supply. And that is this Corsair SF850L SFX. Now this is an 850 watt power supply, which is probably big for the build I'm doing. I never know how this is gonna grow in the future if I add more drives or secondary bays, that kind of thing. I may need that power. And just because you have a larger power supply doesn't mean your system's automatically gonna use it. And since I'm probably not gonna be maxing out this power supply at 850 watts, it means its power characteristics probably be a little bit better, it'll run a little bit cooler, and maybe even give me a little bit more efficiency. But one thing's for sure, it probably will not run as noisy because one feature of this Corsair is that this fan doesn't have to spin. It actually can go down to zero RPMs if the power drain on it and the heat doesn't require it. If you're trying to make a powerful yet quiet build, this is a pretty good power source to start off with. Now, if you're keeping track of the running total, you'll remember that this motherboard costs 90 bucks. Our goal for the entire build is around 500 bucks to compete with the off-the-shelf NAS cases you can buy on the internet. And this power supply just tacked on $125. If you wanted to save on your build, you could go with a larger case that can fit an ATX power supply. You could try to find a smaller SFX. And one other thing you could do is you could choose to not go with the modular design. That might get the price down to maybe somewhere between 40 and $50 on your own build. Because I wanted to keep this neat, I wanted to keep it powerful, and I wanted to keep it quiet. I went with this one and splurged a little bit. Another part of the splurge is definitely going to be this modular design for the cables, which means I only need to connect the cables to this board that I need to run it. This is going to be very tight once it's inside this case and having a whole bunch of cables bundled coming out of the back of the power supply is probably going to get in my way, make the build much more messy. At worst, it's going to decrease the airflow going across the board and potentially decrease the life of the components. So now that I explained exactly why I chose this power supply, let's get it connected to the ATX header and the CPU header on the motherboard and just turn it on and see what happens. Now, this is where the modular connections come in. As you can see, if this was a non-modular power supply, we'd have cables just running out of this. But in this case, all I need to do is just snap in those two cables that I need. I'll also connect the on off button from the test bench. Now I'm just going to reconnect the power plug to the back of the power supply and we can go ahead and switch it on for the first time and see what happens. So an interesting thing, these LEDs on the bottom of the board came on as soon as I turned on the power supply. 
I don't know if that's always going to happen or just because we're booting this board with nothing connected. So we'll have to see what happens. There's probably a way in the BIOS that we can shut them down so that they don't always stay on and use power even when the system is not up and running. If I go ahead and push the on off button or at least our makeshift on off button right here, we can see nothing happens. There's no post lights up on top of the board. But all this is a good thing. It means the board has power and we can go on to the next component. Now, I like to add it component by component because different boards have different ways of troubleshooting, including sometimes little boot lights that tell you what might be wrong as far as each component when you put it in. Going piece by piece, if something fails, we kind of know what piece it might be without having to backtrack by taking everything off the board again. I'm gonna go ahead and put that AMD processor in and then we'll try uh, another boot. But first we gotta make sure we power down the system and disconnect it from the wall. We'll talk about my processor selection a little bit more in detail in a few moments. This is a Ryzen 5 5500. It's a pretty good processor, but the main reason I picked it is for the price. It is the cheapest 5000 series processor I could find. And again, this is not a G series processor because if you watch my motherboard video, you'll know that I wanna use ECC RAM in this and only AMD processors that do not include internal built-in graphics have the ability to receive ECC RAM. All right, let's put it in, boot back up and see what happens. Installing the CPU on an AM4 board is pretty simple. You just lift the lever, drop in the chip, making sure the triangles are aligned. Give it a little shake to make sure everything lines up and then go ahead and close that lever. Now, before we put the CPU cooler in, I'm just gonna use this piece of RAM as a reference to make sure that it doesn't get obstructed when we put the cooler on. For this build, I'm gonna be using the stock RAF cooler that comes along with the AMD chip. To install that, I need to remove the two clips on the side of the chip, and then I can go ahead and test fit the cooler to see if it fits. Now you can see why I left that RAM stick loosely in place there, and that's to make sure that the cooler had enough clearance so that I could also install RAM later on. To make it work in this build, I had to turn the cooler around 180 degrees before fastening it down. It should have been smooth sailing from here. I just had to connect the CPU fan and boot it back up. But wait, there is an error light. The CPU fan was spinning, so it probably just needed the RAM installed, right? Well, I went ahead and did that and nope, wrong. Error light again. So in the interest of full disclosure, that definitely increased the migraine counter by one. Now, I said once we hooked this up and tested the board, we were gonna talk a little bit about my selection of microprocessors. The general rule with this AMD setup when you're trying to use ECC RAM is that you can't use a APU or an advanced processing unit. The APU is basically the regular AMD CPU with a graphics processing unit. That eliminates all the G-series products unless you can find a Pro Series board, which I talked about in the first video. Those are hard to find, so th what I was trying to do was find a non-APU CPU. So that should be anything that's a non-G series. So I went with the AMD 5, was trying to save a little money, get the cheaper version of the 5500 CPU, or as I now found out, APU. After doing some research and not getting this board to work, I found out that this chip is really just one of the G series processors made to be a little cheaper. And what they did is they disabled the graphic processing unit. At least that's what the interweb says. And it doesn't work because of that. So that required me to go out and buy another CPU. This time the 5600 chip. Not much difference between the 56 and the 55 spec wise, except for a few megahertz, which is why I went with the 55. But there is a difference in price. While this chip was running about 85 bucks, this one cost me 120. We'll have to increase the cost of the build by that difference. With all that out of the way, I did install the new chip in the board. And when we go ahead and test it, there's life. We're getting a different set of error codes, but these error codes are related to not having a video card installed and not having a boot drive, which we know we didn't install boot drive and we obviously don't have a video card installed over here. I think the next step on this project is to go ahead and install that video card 
and see if we can actually get it to boot to some kind of BIOS. I wanna point out that I have now installed that one ECC stick of RAM, and this is a 32 gigabyte stick. 128 is maxed out on this board. I did wanna to check to make sure that one stick would work on this board. I do have a second stick just in case. That ECC stick alone costs $80. It will give me 32 gigabytes of RAM, and if I keep using those sticks, I can expand all the way up to 128, maxing out the board, which is a nice thing to be able to test later if I wanna to try to increase the performance of this build at the sake of spending more money. So let's get that video card installed. This is a basic run of the mill, uh, entry level graphics card. We're just gonna modify this a little bit now so that it can fit in a half height like we're gonna need for this case. And it will also make it so that you can see a little bit easier as I'm working around the board. To do that, I just have to take this screw out. All right, when you take that screw out, try not to lose it in case you ever need it again. <laughs> the other thing I'm gonna need to do is take off these covers and remove these retainers right here. So this one I'm not gonna have to do because I'm not gonna use this VGA port so I can just go ahead and disconnect it. On that DVI port, I'm gonna have to take those screws out. Now I can take this cover off, put on the cover for the half height, it goes like this. We can put the little retainers for the plugs back in. Totally lucked out and found that tiny screw, which means migraine averted and tighten that down to hold the plate in place and install the video card. This is just a small M2 120 gigabyte M.2 card. I bought this for 16 bucks, so that's a plus because it's not gonna increase my uh, price too much, especially after going overboard with the um, CPU. And um, I don't need very much space on it. 128 gigs will fit any kind of operating system you're gonna to wanna to put on here for a NAS, especially true NAS. And if you're going with Unraid, you don't even need this because it's gonna boot off of a little thumbstick. So the M2 SD card just goes in at a 45 degree angle. Make sure you put it in the right way. And then you push it down onto the standoff. In this case, the standoff that's already in here is the right size for this card, but this board does have another hole over here. So if you have a shorter SSD card, you can just move it over and screw it down that way. Then you take one of these tiny, tiny screws and screw it in place. Trying not to, again, drop it through your workbench onto the floor. It is time to power this back up. Turning on the power supply plug in the HDMI, push the on button, and see what happens. Cool little LEDs are showing up, and success. We have something on the screen finally, which means everything here is now working. The next step is to go through the BIOS, and then we're pretty much done with testing this system out, and we can get it ready to put inside its case. So I'm gonna go grab a keyboard, and let's take a look at this BIOS. On the first boot of the BIOS, we're gonna see this FTPM screen. And FTPM is a security protocol. And what this is doing is it asking us to reset it because we have a new CPU installed. So if you're like me and this is a brand new motherboard and a brand new CPU, you don't have to think about this, just go ahead and push yes. But if you're repurposing a CPU from another computer that might have some kind of encryption enabled or a bit locker, you might wanna consider this more carefully or you might get locked out and not be able to boot without a recovery key. Once we select yes, the ASRock logo pops back up and we boot right into the BIOS for the first time. From here, we can see some basic computer information such as our BIOS version, our motherboard version, the B550MPG Riptide, our processor type, the AMD Ryzen 5 5600 six core processor, the processor's speed, which is 3500 megahertz, and we also can see our memory, which is a total of 32 gigabytes, and we can see that it is DDR4. What we don't see is whether or not this memory is working in ECC, which is a really important thing for us. There's nothing in this BIOS that's gonna tell us whether or not ECC is working, but there's a workaround to see that data later and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But for those of you that are interested in this motherboard and wanna see a little bit more of the BIOS, here's a quick tour of what you can find. The first page in the BIOS that we come to where we can actually start making changes is the OC Tweaker. And coincidentally, it's the one that we're not gonna touch because we're building a home NAS and the 
key to a home NAS or any server is stability. And while overclocking can boost performance, it can also lower the stability of things like your CPU and your RAM. Both things that we don't want to do. So I'll just say everything you need to do any kind of overclocking is available in this board. So if you do want to overclock, you're perfectly capable of doing that. Next up is the advanced tab, and this is where you'll make most common configuration changes. You can see that there are options for CPU configuration, including all the different modes that are supported. There's also quite a bit of information on the CPU itself. You'll also find the PCI configuration in this menu, board characteristics such as how the LEDs respond and the functioning of the onboard HD audio, the storage configuration, including configuring the SATA mode, this is also where you can see what drives are connected, and you can also see the NVMe configuration. The ACPI configuration, which controls things like how the device powers on, goes to sleep, and other power saving modes. The trusted computing menu with all the security settings. The AMD PBS menu, and this is where you can make some PCI modifications as well as set up things like RAID for the NVMe. There's the AMD overclocking menu, which is specific to the AMD chipset and is a little bit different than using the tweaker. And finally, on the advanced tab, we have the custom BIOS settings, which is a collection of random settings to change all your chipsets and other configuration files. The tools menu is where you'll find a variety of utilities for setting up your LEDs, setting up RAID, secure erasing and sanitizing your hard drives, and flashing your BIOS. Hardware Monitor does exactly what it says, but it also gives you access to fine tune your fan settings, which is interesting because you may want to tweak this a little bit if you're trying to go for a super quiet build. Security is where you set your boot passwords. Boot is where you can set up all your boot options, whether you boot from a LAN, fast boot, that kind of stuff. And finally, exit is where you can exit the BIOS and save all your changes. Now we get to the most important part of this entire build, and that is is the ECC working the way it should? And I mean, not just compatible with the board, but is the ECC error correction actually working? I actually reached out to ASRock and asked their support a question. And I gotta say, they got back to me literally within minutes the first time and followed up with all my questions and gave me some good suggestions on how to test and prove that this ECC was working. And the method I went with was to go and install Memtest86, which is a program for testing memory and giving you statistics about memory, onto a thumb drive. It is bootable, and I plugged that in and booted it up, and here are the results. When Memtest boots, it checks a couple of things and then gives you the option of starting the memory test right away or going to the main menu system. You're going to want to go straight to the main menu system. So here, just click on Config. And voila, that's exactly what we were looking for. Right here, you can see the RAM configuration with ECC enabled, and it even says, yes, ECC correction. Memtest does have some pretty cool features and stats you should check out if you get a chance, but in my case, I'm just gonna jump right to the memory test and run that. Now, the memory test takes a very long time to run. Actually, it takes hours upon hours to run, so I'm just gonna fast forward through that and show you the final results. We've succeeded in successfully building a NAS core system that makes use of ECC RAM. And not only makes use of ECC RAM, it apparently is working correctly. That alone is a challenge in itself. But the question becomes, how much did this all cost? Well, let's go through it and sum it away. So we had the motherboard, that was $90. We had the chip, now remember the first chip was 85 bucks, but because of the non-functioning APU thing, I had to upgrade that to the 5600, so that brought my cost up to 116. Then the next big expense was the power supply. I had hoped to use an $80 ATX power supply, but forgot that this case won't work with a SFX power supply, so that went from 80 up to $150. The next thing was pretty cheap. That's the actual boot drive that I'm using. And that Patriot 128 gig card, that cost $16. And believe it or not, the heat sink I threw on, whether it was needed or not, cost $13, almost as much as the drive. And finally, we have the OWC RAM, and this is a 32 gigabyte stick, and that stick cost me $15.
80 bucks. So what was the grand total? Without the video card, it came in at $466, under the $500 goal. Now, you might ask why I'm not including the video card in that price. Well, you have two options when building a NAS. You don't necessarily need to have a video card in after you get everything installed because you're gonna be connecting to this remotely. But for the sake of argument, I am going to include the video card in the price tag, and that brings us up to 506 because the card itself cost $40. 506 for a complete NAS core system. Now, are there places we could have saved? Absolutely, we, I could have saved money on using a bigger case, not needing the SFX power supply, maybe not caring as much about ECC and using a cheaper processor and cheaper memory. So there are options. It's really up to you on how you wanna configure your system. But if you were looking to build an ECC NAS server system for the home, this is it. This is a complete system and it is completely functioning. So where do we go from here? Well, the next step is to take all of this and put it inside the case and install some software and do some testing. If you wanna follow along with the rest of this build and you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to our channel and hit that bell icon so you get notifications when I release the next video of me putting this inside that case. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. I'll make sure I get to them on this project. Finally, good luck on your NAS build because obviously if you're watching this video, you're considering one, it is doable. You can do it. The components aren't that difficult to find. And with a little help and a little research, you can get exactly what you're looking for. And I think you can do it much better than what you might buy straight off the shelf.